Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Nolutando Nematswerani. On behalf of Discovery Health, uh, SAMA, SAPPF, and UFFP would like to welcome you to tonight's webinar. For those uh, who are coming, I mean, who are joining us for the first time, we welcome you. And for our regular uh, participants, we really welcome you back. Tonight, we are going to be discussing a very interesting topic the state of, um, of play in South Africa relating to COVID-19. I think there are certain developments that have taken place in the past few days and weeks. I think um, our you know, esteemed guests are going to be able to address some of those during this uh, webinar. So tonight's webinar is CPT accredited. Uh, certificates take about a, a week uh, for them to be ready. Queries can be sent to cpd at discovery.co.za. All webinars are, are made available on the Discovery website under the tab for healthcare professionals. You can ask questions using the Q&A button. Please also understand that questions come in high volumes, but we try and, you know, uh, try and theme them and allow the, the speakers to address them uh, as best as they can. We may not be able to get through to all of the questions that are submitted, but we'll endeavor to address all of them during the talk and also during the Q&A session. At the end of the talk, uh, there will be a poll. Uh, please uh, participate and give us feedback so that we know how you have experienced the webinar. We've got two speakers tonight, um, Prof. Glenda Gray, who is well known to most of us. I'm gonna introduce her, her first. She is also joined by Dr. Rabia Johnson, who is going to be the second speaker um, presenting something quite uh, fascinating and interesting for, for us. So Prof. Glenda Gray, like I said, is, is really um, very well known for us. She is the first female president and CEO of the South African Medical Research Council. She's the chair of the research committee on COVID-19, bringing together scientific evidence and experience to the ministerial um, advisory uh, uh, command council for COVID-19. Professor Gray spearheads the, S uh, the, the SAMRC funding broadly and for COVID-19 specifically. She studied uh, medicine and pediatrics at Wirtz University, where she remains a full professor in research in the School of uh, Clinical Medicine. She is a National Research Foundation A1 uh, rated uh, scientist um, and is a world, a world renowned uh, for her research in HIV vaccines and interventions to prevent mother to child transmission of HIV. She co founded and led uh, with Professor James McIntyre the globally. Uh, globally eminent perinatal HIV research unit at Chris Ani Baragwanath Hospital in Soweto. For this work, she and Prof McIntyre received the Nelson Mandela Health and Human Rights Awards, um, in, uh, Award in 2002. She is co-principal investigator of the National Institute of Health funded HIV vaccine trials network and directs the program in, in Africa. Amongst many others, uh, Prof Grace accolades include the Hero of Medicine Award from the International Association of Physicians in AIDS Care and the Outstanding Africa Scientist Award from the European and Developing Countries um, Clinical Trials Partnership. Uh, Forbes named Prof Gray one of Africa's most powerful women and Time also named her one of the world's 100 most influential people. In 2013, she was awarded South Africa's highest honor, the Order of Mabu Mubwe. Her qualification in her qualifications include MBCHB, a qualification in pediatrics at DSC um, from the University of Simon Fraser, um, and also from uh, Stellenbosch University, and also an LLD from uh, Rhodes University. So, like I said, we also have a second speaker, Dr. Johnson, who is a National Research Foundation uh, rated C2 scientist who received a PhD at Stellenbosch University in 2007. Her focus was on understanding the mechanism of drug resistance at TB. The work resulted in several publications that have received over 400 citations. Um, in January 2014, she changed her research focus and is currently working as a principal investigator at uh, SAM, SAMRC. She is a senior specialist scientist and deputy director at Biomedical Research and Innovation Platform at SAMRC. She also holds an extraordinary senior lecturer position within the Division of Medical Physiology, Department of Biomedical Science um, at the University of Stellenbosch. She's affiliated with SA Heart, 
Association and has been appointed as an NRF rating a specialist a committee member for the next five years on the biochemistry, molecular and cell biology panel. Her main research niche is on diabetes and, is asso and its associated cardiovascular and hypertensive complications. Her research group focuses on identifying, no identifying novel cardioprotective therapies and on understanding the pathophysiology of diabetes-induced cardiovascular dysfunction. She has published over 40 articles in peer review journals, uh, has an age index of 16, and her publications have received at least 900 uh, citations. To date, she has built both local and international collaborations and graduated young black students from various under-resourced institutions, including the University of Zululand, Walter Sisulu University, and the University of the Western Cape. She recently became involved in SARS-CoV-2 uh, surveillance in wastewater, and she will be sharing that research with us tonight. So I would like to really uh, welcome our two esteemed um, guest speakers and welcome all our attendees and participants uh, to tonight. I think the CVs, as you, you can hear, they, they actually speak for themselves. So we are really excited uh, to hand over to Prof. Uh, Glenda Gray and Dr. Rabia Johnson to take us through tonight's webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I share my screen? Um, yes. Please. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Um, good, good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to the webinar. Um, on behalf of uh, Rabia Johnson and myself, we're going to take you through two presentations looking at the state of play of COVID-19 in South Africa. I'm just trying to look how do you, I can't seem to forward my, oh, there we are. Um, so in terms of, of the overview of the, of the presentation, we can talk a little bit about SARS-CoV-2 virus, some of the transmission and clinical events, um, some global and local epidemiology, mortality trends in South Africa, and how research can shift the needle and present some innovation in the management of the current and future epidemics, um, or in future epidemics. Um, so I want to quote Francois Fenter, who said um, that SARS-CoV-2 is a beast of a virus, and indeed it is a beast of a virus. And so we first heard about this um, COVID-19 when it emerged in December 2019 with a cluster of patients with pneumonia of unknown cause, um, which was recognized in Wuhan, China. And this virus has gone on in the last couple, seven, eight months, has gone on now to affect more than 200 countries with more than 13.5 million deaths worldwide and more than half a, and more than half a million deaths. I mean, 13.5 million cases worldwide and more than half a million deaths. And in South Africa, as of last night, we had over 311 cases and over and around 4,500 deaths. So if you look at the epidemiology epi of, of COVID-19, you'll see that this genetic sequence is quite close to the bat strains of coronavirus. And there's a suggestion of a secondary host which acquired COVID-19 from bats and was transmitted in the human, to humans at the Wuhan wholesale seafood market. And the possible candidate um, has been um, purported to be the pangolin, which is this cute little mammal. Uh, it's seen in this picture next to, next to us, whose scales are used in traditional medicine. And this poor little animal is the most illegally trafficked animal in the world. So in terms of human coronaviruses, there are four non-SARS-like human coronaviruses. And these viruses normally cause mild respiratory illness. They occur both naturally and with experimental challenge. They occasionally cause lung disease in immunocompromised persons. In, in coronavirus infection, we usually have seasonal activity. It usually arises in winter and early spring. Uh, they tend to recur at two to four year cycles which suggests natural infection is not long, uh, has, not, has no long-term protection. And obviously this type of seasonal persistence is a great worry for us for SARS-CoV-2, um, albeit that this disease is quite different from the other human respiratory coronaviruses that we've seen before. So what makes SARS coronavirus much more severe than any other human coronavirus is that this virus invades the deep tissue of the human body, the lung, the heart, and the GRT, GRT tract. The virus lands on our nasal, epithelial, and lung tissue and replicates in these tissues. And just recently in a paper from Nature Structural and Molecular Biology, 
um, who, the, who, who did the crystallography um, of, the, of SARS-CoV-2, we see that COVID-19 is a thousand times better at infecting humans than its closest relative, which has been found in bats. And it's because this is this COVID-19 has, has evolved from several coronaviruses which have merged together. And scientists at Francis Kick um, Institute have studied the structure of this of the of the coronavirus spikes, and they found that the spike is about 97% identical um, to the bat um, uh, coronavirus, but with small key differences. And these small key differences um, stabilize the virus and actually make it a thousand times better at binding to ACE2 receptors. And the ACE2 receptors are critical because these are the receptors that, um, that the virus needs to enter into our body. And it's called, it's the body's entry key. And it's how people get infected um, with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. In terms of transmission symptoms and complications of COVID-19, I'm just going to summarize it in this slide because you've heard a lot um, about this in, in other webinars. But just to remind you that transmission occurs by respiratory droplets. Um, from contaminated surfaces. And just recently, we've heard that aerosol spread um, is also responsible um, for uh, transmission. And obviously, this may has implications for indoor ventilation and issues around uh, the use of um, air conditioning and such. And so um, we have to try and, and establish how we can minimize aerosol, aerosol spread in, in closed areas and how we improve ventilation to, to avert um, the, the propagation of of um, coronavirus through aerosol spread. But about 40, about 50% of transmission occurs before people are, um, uh, are, are symptomatic um, and, um, and before they know that they have any evidence of, 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 um, of infection. It presents with a, a fever, a dry cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, myalgias, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, weakness, weakness, rhinorrhea, and quite, quite importantly that you can sometimes distinguish between um, influenza virus and coronavirus is this loss of smell and taste that sometimes can persist for quite a long time. We see in terms of column, common lab abnormalities will include lymphopenia, elevated inflammatory markers, and abnormal coagulation parameters that, that are, are picked up when um, uh, patients are admitted. In terms of radiological findings, we see this bilateral lower lobe um, predominant infiltrates with ground glass opacities and um, consolidation um, also on chest um, uh, CT imaging. And we know that the complications, we know that there's a, a viral phase, a, a pneumonia phase, and a, 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 an inflammatory phase. And, and, and complications of the infection can cause pneumonia, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute liver injury, cardiac injury, acute heart failure, Prothrombotic coagulopathy, which results in venous and arterial thromboembolic events, acute renal injury, neuro manifestations, and um, acute cerebrovascular disease and shock. And this is what we see um, as patients progress and um, and um, are, need are needed to be um, admitted to hospital high care and, and ventilation. And obviously, the complications um, among critically ill patients include the cytokine storm and macrophage activation syndrome, um, which is, is has been quite hard to, to manage. Looking at um, trying to diagnose COVID-19 has been quite perplexing. And um, the, the RT-PCR, the real-time PCR, remains the, the gold standard um, for diagnosing um, uh, COVID-19. And, um, and um, this, this slide just shows you um, uh, that the best, uh, the best time to pick it up is around um, between uh, uh, five to seven days, the, the around um, five days after you become symptomatic, your RT-PCR becomes more positive. Um, the IgG and IgM um, appear much later, and so aren't really good for, for, for diagnostic purposes, but or maybe quite good for seroprevalence surveys and trying to understand who may have been previously exposed. Unfortunately, we're seeing reports that um, the IgG doesn't remain uh, for a long time, and there are issues around um, um, how, how protective um, the IgM and IgG antibodies are and um, what are the um, 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 factors that may, may confer protection and um, how long does this immune, immunity last and can one get reinfection once the, um, um, the um, once, uh, IgG uh, starts to dissipate in the body. And so as, as we understand the natural uh, history of, of, of COVID-19 and as we, we, we follow up people, 
we'll be able to see whether uh, reinfection is a possibility and we'll also be able to evaluate um, how long um, um, being, um, how long uh, having COVID-19 can it confer protection for um, in the future. What's important um, to understand is, as, as what we've seen in South Africa, is that um, managing uh, COVID-19 cases in, in hospital and in ICU has, has, uh, has um, resulted in a reduction in mortality. And this comes from some data that um, Emil Stipp uh, um, showed, uh, showed me that showed um, the reduction in mortality over time as people became used to managing um, uh, COVID-19 in, in ICU and with new, with new advents like nursing prone, the early use of oxygen, uh, the introduction of high flow nasal oxygen, use of dexamethasone, anticoagulation strategies, and, um, and now we're evaluating the impact of newer interventions like some antivirals um, and, and, um, and, and IL-6 inhibitors that may, may play a role, particularly in um, rem remdesivir is an antiviral, which will play an important part in the viral phase of the infection. And, um, and um, interleukin-6 inhibitors will play a role in, in, in trying to manage the cytokine storm, as would um, um, dexamethasone. So just to go back a little bit, I showed you a little bit about the, um, the clinical progression, and we'll go a little bit back in terms of epidemiology, back to Wuhan in China. And these are some pictures that were shared that, um, you know, um, as the epidemic unfolded um, in Wuhan and um, how things started to emerge from late uh, December. Um, so what we've started to see was this emergence of the SARS-CoV-2. And, and basically, um, this is a, a virus which is a bad news wrapped in a, in, a, in a protein. And this is the structure. These little, um, these little spikes are important. And this is where um, um, a lot of the vaccines um, that are being developed are, um, are aimed to, to work on the, the spike protein um, of these um, of the of the SARS-CoV-2 in an effort to to uh, raise immunogenicity to that to that area, but what is very important, and and this is what Robbie will talk to you about later, is that um, the, the the importance of early warning um, uh, systems, and um, there there were a group of people, a group of Canadians um, that um, started to 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 watch um, this international spread. Of a, then an unnamed disease, um, and at that stage they submitted this article. So around December, uh, around the first of January, when all of us were were still sleeping or having a party, uh, these guys noticed that something was going on, and they they submitted um, in seven days, seven eight days, they submitted their article to Journal of Travel Medicine, and they listed 20 cities considered to be at risk on 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 based on travel data and an infectious disease vulnerability index. And this was a, a, um, an important um, a marker of an early uh, warning system. And in fact, on the, on the um, very early in January, just, just this, almost the second week of January, um, these, these um, scientists were warning um, uh, about the, um, the international, potential international spread of an unnamed disease, which happened to be a coronavirus at that stage. So since then, what's happened? You know, we've seen this global distribution, um, 13.5 million infections, and yeah, you see um, how the, the the epidemic has moved over time, and um, how Latin America um, is 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 accounting for now 48% um, of the global deaths, and there's a huge a huge area of infection. We see how North America um, is still struggling with the disease um, um, and still has an epidemic that's out of control. And then we start to see a low middle income countries like um, India and South Africa and, and Africa starting to come and emerge. And it'll be interesting to see over time um, how, um, how Africa, how, um, how the global distribution of COVID-19 starts to affect um, the, the rest of, of Africa. But as you see it on this slide, um, these are the hotspots at the moment. And uh, South Africa is definitely the hotspot in Africa. And um, there may be variable reasons for why we are the hotspot in Africa. Maybe it's we're doing the most testing in Africa, and we um, have um, um, so we, we have a better um, handling or understanding of the of the COVID um, epidemic in our on our continent. South South Africa um, has the largest um, testing program in Africa, and um, also um, has 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 the 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 largest epidemic. Um, however, we will see over time. Uh, looking at mortality rates, um, how COVID-19 has affected the rest of Africa. 
if you look at our cumulative number of infections, you can see that we've rapidly um, increased. Um, and and the, the, the table, the graph on the left shows uh, South Africa um, a few days ago, three, you know, three or four days ago, at just, un just um, under 300,000 infections, um, um, one of the fastest growing um, epidemics. And then you also see um, uh, the reproductive rate for South Africa. Um, and this obviously the reproductive rate is very important because uh, this tells you how, how, um, how the virus is spreading. And obviously if you want to try and control um, the epidemic, you need to aim for a reproductive rate of under one. And um, you can see we've hovered between 1.1 and 1.5. And um, you can see that the reproductive rate has remained stable towards the end of level five lockdown um, and, um, and level four and level three. So very much the same uh, since about the 21st of April, um, uh, which is indicative of the community spread in South Africa. The important thing to note also is that South Africa still has not peaked and is above the average where European countries peak. So yeah, you see the, um, the, 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 um, the data for Gauteng. Um, yeah, you see the, 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 the green is the um, South Africa, and, um, the, and, and yeah, you, you can see Western Cape as well. And yeah, you can see that um, um, when you look at, at what rate um, uh, countries peaked, um, you can see that um, it was around 14.6 daily new infections for 100,000 people in Chile. And in Gauteng, you can see that we already um, doubled that at 33.4 daily new infections per 100,000, and we haven't peaked yet. In, in the Western Cape, it was around 16.9 daily new infections. Um, in South Africa, on, on, on average, it's around 20 um, daily new infections. And then you see in comparison to places like Sweden, 3.7 daily infections, it Italy peaked at 9.3, and the UK peaked at 8.1. And so you can see um, we, as a low middle income country uh, setting, we still haven't peaked and, um, and uh, we need to uh, um, observe how the epidemic uh, um, unfolds in South Africa. It's important to understand um, the age distribution of, of COVID infections in South Africa. And this is data from the NICD from last night, 15th of July. And it shows you the distribution between females and, and males, and also shows you the, the age range um, that of people getting infected. And I think it's important just to, to show you um, that um, uh, children uh, 0 to 4, 5 to 9, 10 to 14, um, and, and under 20 uh, ha still have the lowest rate um, of COVID uh, cases in the country. And you can see it increases as you become more, more, um, uh, more mobile, more active, um, with, with a, a huge number of infections in the, um, in the 25 to, to 45 year old age range. But this just shows you the, the age group of people that are infected in South Africa. If you look at hospital admissions again, and this is data from um, yesterday again, um, you can see that um, this is, shows you the total admissions for men and f women and men, which are kind of equal. But again, I want to make the, um, the uh, emphasis is that um, uh, very low rates of um, admissions for children under 10 and children under, under 20. Um, and yeah, you can see the distribution of deaths. Again, I want to just uh, say that the death rates um, are highest in people um, um, over 50. Um, and as we know, the older you are, the more, um, the, more, the more your mortality increases and the more comorbidity you have, the more likely to you are to have mortality. But also very important to know that very, very um, low rates of, uh, of death are reported in children in, in these sentinel sites um, um, in, in, in children um, um, under 20, um, and as well as a low rates in, in, in under under 30 year olds and under 40 year olds. So I think that's very important to know as we talk about schooling and as we worry about our children going back to school, um, you can see that um, uh, the, that coronavirus um, has, has, has not affected children. They are biological reasons. They have less ACE2 receptors than adults. Uh, the immune responses um, uh, may be different, which may confer them a, a better ability to manage the, um, the inflammatory phase of the, of the of the infection and also um, maybe prior exposure to um, recent circulating coronaviruses may have conferred some kind of cross protection. But we're not exactly sure uh, why children um, are, are, are not affected, but these are the, some of the biological reasons that have been, um, have been put forth. 
If you look at our weekly death rates, now the MRC under Debbie Bradshaw um, does, um, has been collecting the weekly death rates for many years. And um, they, the, this burden of disease tracks death rates in South Africa, compares them from years before, and, and you have um, a forecast which is based on prior years um, uh, um, death rates. And you can see that, that you can see the death rate in South Africa um, coming up. And we've had about um, just around 11,000 excess deaths um, um, since the 6th of May as compared to what we would have expected last year. And in the, sec the, the graphs below show you the death rate between 1 to 59 years of age and then the, um, the, the, the deaths amongst the, the, the over 60s. And you can see that the over 60s have borne the, borne the burden of excess death rates, which is in keeping with the kind of data we see um, from the rest of the world. If you look at Cape Town Metro, um, we, we have seen um, three, almost 3,000 excess deaths since the 6th of May. Um, and the good news is it looks like the death rates in the Cape Metro are coming down. And so we watch this carefully, um, which means that um, the epidemic may be um, under control in, in Cape Town. Um, when you start to see death rates go down, then that's always a, a good sign. If you look at Johannesburg Metro, um, you can again see that um, it's on a spike and that there's been about 1,120 excess deaths since June, since the 10th of June, and we need to monitor this um, as we know Gauteng is in the middle of a surge. And so it'll be important to see um, uh, the death rate and to follow it so we can have an indication when um, the, the, the epidemic is, um, is under control in, in Gauteng. Again, I wanted to show you, um, because of the concern in, 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 um, about, children, about school children, and this just shows you um, uh, the death rates in school-going children in South Africa. And we've, as I said, we've charted these for many years. The, the, orange, the orange is what we forecast, and the, the black is, is, is what we see. And you can see that um, we have not seen increased deaths in 5 to 19-year-olds um, um, this year. Um, which reassures us that the data that we see internationally, we're also seeing in South Africa around school-going children. I wanted to just bring in quickly um, uh, some of the new guidelines that are going to be developed that are in progress um, about the de-isolation and also because, because of healthcare workers wanting to know uh, when people can get back to work. And so in terms of, um, so in terms of um, um, the de-isolation which is proposed, that in mild cases, um, you know, we, we propose to de-isolate 10 days after symptom onset and um, in severe days, uh, 10 days after clinical stability has been achieved of oxygen. And uh, we're proposing no indication for repeat PCR testing. PCR won't differentiate um, viable virus from the presence of RNA. And um, uh, you should assess the medical fitness for return to work. And if, if people already are, are fit to return to work, these are, this is the de-isolation proposal we are recommending for healthcare workers. Um, for a healthcare worker um, who's quarantined, this is what we proposed, um, that um, for, 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 um, for, for who meets the, the, the element for, for, for quarantine. And so if there's been a high risk exposure, and we define a high risk exposure um, less than one meter, and the person didn't have adequate or, um, or had no PPE, um, and, um, and, and was less than one meter in, um, in access to, in, 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 in contact to the person that, that was the case. Um, if there are no symptoms, and if the PCR at five days is negative, um, we, said we are recommending that people de-isolate, uh, return to work with full PPE, and you monitor symptoms and avoid um, immunocompromised patients. So important, um, if you have had a high-risk exposure, um, you have no symptoms and your PCR at, at day five is negative, we're recommending that you de-isolate and return to work with full PPE and you monitor the symptoms and you take care. In terms of the de-isolation of COVID positive persons, uh, so the, the other one was of, of an exposure, so this is someone that we're proposing who, who is COVID positive. In mild cases, we are recommending that people can return to work 10 days after symptom onset and um, for severe disease, we, um, we are, um, we are, you need to evaluate, um, uh, evaluate the, um, the, 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 the patient. And after, after 10 days, um, and, um, uh, you, 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 um, you may um, return back to work. 
And the, the indication for PCR testing, we don't recommend because again, um, you won't be able to differentiate between viable virus versus the presence of RNA. So very important um, uh, to, to know that a repeat testing um, after the initial diagnosis isn't helpful uh, for um, the ongoing, um, um, uh, for recommending the isolation of people. In terms of quarantine, the proposed guidance is, is no change, so that um, if there has been a high risk exposure, which is defined as less than one meter for more than 15 minutes, um, we are recommending quarantine for 14 days, then de-isolate with no repeat testing required. So there is a difference between exposure, uh, quarantine, and, and, um, and, and having, having COVID-19. So I'm going to end here, but I want to just end by saying is that um, we all have a responsibility to prevent the onward propagation of, of COVID-19. And this, this slide just shows you the importance of a mask. Um, and if you do have COVID-19, without a mask, you can see um, how much aerosol and droplets you can spread. And with a mask, you can see how you can reduce um, and slow down the spread of, of COVID-19. And so um, you have to wear a mask, um, you have to wash your hands, you have to avoid congestion, and you, you have to make sure you have physical or social distancing. I'd like to thank uh, Rabia, in, she's gonna talk now, Lucille for lending me, for showing, send, sharing her slides with me, Debbie for all the hard work she does at a burden of disease, she'll be, um, for um, you know some of some input, Larry for some of the slides and um, Emil Stip for sharing me some of the data from the ICU. So I'm going to end there and stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Glenda. So I will um, start my presentation now. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Can you can you see my screen? Not yet. Hmm. Um. We can see it now. Can you see it now? Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So once again, thank you very much, everybody. And thank you very much for the organizing committee for inviting me um, on this platform. So like Professor Gray was saying today, I'm gonna give you a little bit of overview of what scientists are doing currently globally and how they are using wastewater epidemiology um, as an early warning strategy in our fight against COVID-19. So wastewater-based epidemiology has historically been used to study enteric viruses such as your polio and your measles. And we want to use the same strategy now in our fight against COVID-19 to track the epidemic and understand how this epidemic unfolds. So then our question is, so how are we as scientists gonna do this? So we know that uh, whether the patient with um, asymptomatic or symptomatic um, symptoms of COVID-19 we know that they shed the virus in their stool. This then goes into the sewer, then into the wastewater treatment plant. So in the wastewater treatment plant, we will then collect the sample. The sample will then be, the, the viral RNA will then be extracted. And then we will use a PCR technology to amplify the viral RNA. And this will give us an indication whether or not the virus was present or whether the virus was absent within the specific sample. But yeah, I would also like to um, tell the audience that this virus is not transmissible and we call it the inactive virus when the virus is in, this, in the um, switch system. And uh, as such, 
you can also then take this um, data that comes off this PCR machine to, to say whether or not the virus was present or absent. You can also use this now. And when you take the population that this specific wastewater treatment plant is serving and you do a mathematical calculation, you can actually quantify the virus. And by quantifying the virus, you are able to say whether or not what's the viral load in that specific population. And this type of wastewater epidemiology, you can then use that as an early warning strategy to identify the virus. Dr. Johnson, yes. can you please pause a bit? Uh, we're trying to sort out your slides. Is it not moving? Yeah. Oh. Yes, I'm on that slide now. Yes. So now it's okay. moving. I yeah. think it's a lag. Yes, yeah, you... maybe there's a lag so that your voice uh, is louder. Thank you. Okay. 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 Sorry. So we want to use this type of um, wastewater-based epidemiology now as an early warning strategy to identify clinical outbreaks prior to the onset of any clinical symptoms being shown and use this to identify hotspots in various geographical areas. And this is important for our public health strategy to combat um, in the fight against this disease. And this will then also be a cost-effective strategy for wide-scale community screening where once you identify the hotspot, you can send resources in there for testing and tracing using this type of methodology. So this has been used as we're not the first persons reporting, uh, people reporting on this. So the first confirmed detection of SARS-CoV-2 in untreated wastewater was um, documented in Australia. So AMID was also the, one of the first publications that came to the forefront. There are over 30 publications on um, wastewater epidemiology. I wanna bring your attention to this specific graph here. This is COVID-19 cases per day in the public health um, system in Queensland. And this is the total cumulative COVID-19 positive cases um, over this specific period of time, with the first cases be, case being identified in February. And this is um, the, just the trend showing all the positive cases. Then I want to bring your attention to the bottom um, graph. Now, this is, if this is the trend of the cumulative cases in Queens, Queensland, now they look at the um, Brisbane area within Queensland, and these are vari various areas within Brisbane. And what they did here was, they map the wastewater treatment plant that serves this population onto the various areas in Brisbane where they showed the positive cases. And interestingly enough, they were able to show that they, were, they can detect viral RNA from the wastewater system within the Brisbane area. And if you look at this spot here, it shows that they were even able to detect it early enough between February and March. And I think the first case was between January and February. So when they screened for it, they were able to detect it early in February already. So this study only shows that you, you can quantify it using wastewater and the presence and absence can be uh, determined using wastewater. Dr. John. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, okay. Yes, can you, I don't know, maybe your voice is a bit low. If you can come okay, closer. I'll come closer. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. You just need okay. to a little bit more. Thank you so, so much. No problem. So for me, this is the PICA study. In this study, SARS-CoV RNA concentrations in primary sludge was determined. And for this study, they look at the quantification, the viral load in the wastewater. So what makes the study so interesting is I want to bring your attention to this red line. This is the red line is the wastewater, the viral RNA detected in wastewater that confirms um, the, 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 the virus was shed in wastewater and that it was present. This is your COVID new cases that, was, um, that came in over the specific period of time, time in New Haven. So this Yale study shows nicely how they were able to detect the vi viral RNA seven days prior to the, um, the first diagnosis within the new cases within the specific um, time period. What was more interesting was 
you can see here the viral RNA peaked three days prior to the peak seen in the new confirmed cases. You can see they follow exactly the similar trend. And when there was a decline with the viral RNA detected in the wastewater, a similar trend was seen within the new cases where there was also a decline. So that for me was a, quite an interesting study and various other similar studies followed onto this. So what does this actually mean for South Africa? So that South Africa and various other low to middle income countries, we know that the prevalence is influenced by the frequency um, of screening or testing in that specific area. We also know that poorly resourced areas is actually underreported. And as such, uh, early this wastewater epidemiology and an early warning strategy would then uh, be perfect for, for, for South Africa. Reason being, the, our health systems, there's various constraints within our health systems, like your testing kits limitation, human resources limit, limitations, as well as PPE limitations to that. So early warning strategies using ba a, a wastewater-based epidemiology can then be used to pinpoint or to identify the hot spots within those specific geographical locations. Um, then health workers or the, the, our, our public health can, can then guide action to distribute um, the resources to that, those specific hotspots. Um, we are also aware that um, within our country that approximately 37% of South African households is not connected to the sewer system and they rely on pit latrines and bucket toilets. We also know that approximately 23 individuals would share a pit latrine. So this will be the constraints when we roll out such a um, epidemiological study where we use it as an early warning sign. How um, a strategy, however, I must say that using the strategy, we will still be able to um, qualitatively say uh, whether or not the virus is present or absent within the specific area. So based on what others has found globally, we then decided to do a proof of concept study. So, um, and the whole aim behind the proof of concept study was to evaluate wastewater of five wastewater treatment plants in the Athlone, the Cape Flats, the Zanfit, Makassa and Stellenbosch wastewater works as the basis for an early warning strategy for the, to, for the transmission of COVID-19 in this high risk setting. For this, we decided the study design, we're going to look both qualitative analysis and there we want to see within these five wastewater plants, can we determine the presence or the absence of this virus? We also looked at it quantitatively. So if you look at this picture here below, remember I said the virus is shed in stool and then it goes into a wastewater treatment plant. So here, this wastewater treatment plant these various sub-districts that this waste um, water treatment plant serves, so various population, um, various um, uh, sewage will go into um, from different sub-districts will go into the the wastewater treatment plant. So what we want to do is quantify this and say once we detect it and say yes, it's present using the PCR technology, we can then use this and multiply that by this uh, population that is the specific wastewater treatment plant is serving, that will give us a quantified number where we can talk about viral copy number per capita. And that will tell us, that will be able, that will help us to identify the hotspots within um, the specific areas. So this is a normal strategy that we would uh, follow. You would go to the wastewater treatment plant, you would collect the sample and the sample will be taken on ice to the laboratory and immediately within um, 24 hours, we would then process the sample by extracting the RNA. And that's a very important step. Once you've extracted the RNA, you can then do the PCR. Once you have the PCR, then you just do a little bit of mathematical calculation where you can then use the, um, the population that that specific wastewater treatment plant is serving and um, times that with a copy number that you got from the PCR, and that will tell you what's the viral load per capita within that specific population. So this is the first result, and this result we attained on the 10th of June when we just sample, and this is not, I'm not giving you results yet of the phase five, five wastewater plants. 
this is just to show whether or not our methodology is going to work. So this is the RNA that was extracted from these samples. And this means that the RNA was, of, um, there was enough RNA with extract or viral RNA extracted in this tube. But when you look at this number, the COVID-19 viral RNA is just a minute amount within the total viral, viral RNA that you are seeing here. Now I want to bring your attention to this graph here. Please look at the green line. So anything above the green line means that it's positive for COVID-19. Like for example, the sample will be negative. So here we showed we use specific primers to detect the COVID-19 and we're using the CDC approved primers. They call it the N1 and the N2 primers. And here we can show that the sample was positive for both the N1 and the N2 primer. So we did exactly the same thing. This is still proof of concept for our five wastewater plants. This is now the Athlone, the Cape Flight, Zandvliet, Makassar, and then the Stellenbosch wastewater treatment plant. Here again, you can see that we were able to attain sufficient amounts of RNA to continue to do the PCR now. So when I'm talking about the RNA, it's similar to when you do a COVID test and you take a swab test. The first thing that the laboratory has to do is extract the RNA. In this case, we're just extracting the RNA from water now. So once um, we extracted the RNA, and this is how a typical PCR will look that comes off the machine. So I just want to show you again, look at the blue line here and look at the red line here. The blue lines, everything above it is positive. Everything above the red line is positive. Once again, we make sure that we use the in one and in two primers, which is specific to pick up the COVID-19 viral RNA. And once again, we could see that all our samples from those wastewater plants was able to amplify, which means they were positive for COVID-19 using both N1 and the N2 primer set. So I'm going to depict the same data that I've just showed you now in a graph format. So this is exactly what I've showed you now. This is just analyzed data. So this is once it comes off the machine, then we speak about it as viral copy number. So we can see that the Cape Flats in the Zandvliet had higher viral copy number, for example, compared to your Stellenbosch area. But now we need to correct because that um, this data is the, we have attained it from the wastewater plant, but there was, we have to correct it for the flow of water that came into the wastewater plant from the various population or the various areas that it served. So to normalize for that, we normalize for the water that flow, in, flow into the, was this fly, um, that flow into the um, wastewater plant, was flowing into the wastewater plant, and we found that the Cape Flats in Zandvliet we're still seeing a similar trend where the viral load was much higher here compared to Stellenbosch. Then our last analysis was then to look at the population that that specific wastewater plant was serving to give us our final answer. And when we did that um, calculation and we say viral copies per day per 100 in, um, uh, individuals, 1,000 individuals, here we could see that once again, so definitely the Cape Flats and the Zandvliet had much higher um, values compared to your Stellenbosch area. So just because it's a proof of concept study, we then decided let's map this back to the COVID-19 dashboard. So there's a COVID-19 dashboard and we went on there and this will tell you the cases on that specific day that we sampled. So these samples were taken on the 18th of June. So when these samples were taken on the 18th of June, what did, for example, Kailicha and Stellenbosch um, look like? We chose Kailicha. Kailicha is just one sub-district that is uh, one area that is served by the Zanfleet um, wastewater treatment plant. So we're just using this as an example compared to um, the Stellenbosch. And you, when we mapped that back, we found that there was on that day that we collected, there was 82 cases in the Kailicha area positive COVID-19 cases and 43 in the Stellenbosch area. And this confirm what others globally has found that you can use it as a means to identify hotspots or to determine quantitatively determine the viral load. This is so exactly what we are seeing here. But because this was a small study, 
we um sorry so um for further analysis so basically we collected the sample here from so this is the inflow from various sub districts into this wastewater plants for example um if you should look at the Cape Town area and you look, for example, Athlone. Athlone gets water from Tigerberg, Plat Plattekloof, um, uh, Paro, from various areas. This is how you must see this map. So what we are saying, instead, if we should go to the, instead of the wastewater treatment plant, we collect at the wastewater pumps as well, that will be a better population estimate for the viral load within that specific area. And that is where we would really like to go next to see if we can sample here instead of here would be, and that would be a bit more accurate. So what are we currently doing? So currently, we continue the, the next phase of the proof of concept study. And this is the study that is currently ongoing. And in, the, in Cape Town, there's 24 wastewater treatment plants. And we've decided let's um, sample at each and every one of these wastewater plants. We are also going to sample every single day we are sampling for the next six to eight weeks are we going to sample. So I can't wait for this data to come off so that we can analyze it because I hope that we will be able to see, for example, if you look about, if you think about the PECA study, where the PECA study predicted what's going to happen and the COVID-19 positive cases followed that prediction. So currently we know that within Cape Town in some areas, we could see that there is um, the, the data, the um, numbers are plateauing. So, and I'm wondering, will this predict exactly what will happen next? If we should screen and analyze this data afterwards to see was there an increase and are we seeing a similar trend? Is it coming down or is it just gonna plateau out? What's really gonna happen? So unfortunately, this is ongoing. We're in week two now, so I don't have that data. We're doing something similar in Limpopo and in the Eastern Cape. And the other provinces is being done by other collaborators um, that's, that's looking at the other provinces. So we, after this, we will look at Limpopo and Eastern Cape as well. And so what are we going to do post the proof of concept study? So, um, sorry. So using this um, wastewater-based epidemiology as an early warning strategy, we say we can then use this to identify, hopefully identify the, um, or we predict that we can identify the hotspots within um, the Cape Town area using this type of technology or this type of um, uh, protocol. And what would be interesting also, it would be to say that, um, once we identify the hotspots and we send out resources to that hotspots to mitigate it, we hope if we screen again there that we can use the same type of technology then to say, are there now a reduction in the prevalence after we've um, sampled there now? And what's even more interestingly interesting would be then to say, post the COVID-19 pandemic, we really would like to continue screening within the wastewater plants and hopefully by doing so, if there should be any new outbreaks, we would be able to ad identify it ahead of time. And for me, this is especially important, this type of strategy for those asymptomatic patients that's transmitting the disease and nobody knows of them, yet they are shedding the virus and we will be able to detect that virus in the um, wastewater um, uh, and, and that will add to the to the to the numbers and um, to us by being able to identify um, the specific hotspots. So, in a nutshell, I would like to say that the proof of concept study was previously has previously showed uh, to work globally, and if our study confirms previous findings that it is reasonably and the, and and we also using the study and if we should show that it's reasonably accurate. accurate then this would be a really interesting tool to be used as an early warning system that we can roll up that can aid public health officials to identify those hotspots and send resources into those hotspots to curb um, or, or, or to aid with this, with this current um, 
um, a pandemic. And again, I would like to iterate, especially um, the asymptomatic cases that's spreading and without us knowing and contributing um, towards the, the increased numbers that we are currently seeing. Um, I would like to thank our, the SAMRC Executive Board members, Professor Gray, Dr. Uh, McLurley, also my mentors, Professor Johan No, Christo Miller, uh, my lab mate Samira Gur, Professor Marty van der Wald, Awilani, and also our international collaborator, Hub, um, Hubert um, Haldeblom from Seattle. Then uh, um, also some um, Professor Rene Street, Angela Matisse, and then the Stellenbosch group, Edward Archer, that without them, we wouldn't have been where we are today also. And um, also to, to Ludwig, who's, who collect our samples and then to the city of Cape Town. If the city of Cape Town didn't give us permission, then we would not have been able to collect the samples. So thank you very much, everybody. Oh, sorry, thank you so much, I was uh, on mute. Thank you so much, very interesting um, presentation. Uh, I hope most people got uh, to hear most of what you were saying, but I think, I mean, the slides assisted, even though the sound was uh, uh, slightly low, but so we do apologize for the sound. Just one or two quick questions um, for you, uh, Dr. Johnson, before I ask Prof, how long does the RNA last in the water? That's one of the questions. And also it's a question around whether the wastewater treatment plants are located close to hospitals. Um, rural or urban communities, so uh, where you were sampling? So the first question, how long does it last? So the Utah study, we would like, after this, we stored some samples and we would like to um, do, the, do the test ourselves. But from the Utah study, they showed that at four degrees, at, there's a twofold log decrease. And they say at 80 degrees, um, if you store your sample at 80 degrees, there's an 80% uh, decay within a, apparently a month's time. So that's why we are saying you process that sample immediately as soon as possible. And that's mm -hmm. why even when we look at the sub-districts, the retention time from the sample to get to the sewer, even there, there will be decay. And that's why you, as soon as the sample comes in, you need to process that sample. And we, we process at MRC, we process within 16 hours. Maybe, maybe you should just talk about how they picked up um, uh, the virus uh, months before the cases happen in Italy. Uh, do you want to uh, mention that? Yes, yes. There's also a study in Spain as well where they showed that they, um, using this type of technology, they were able to detect the virus in was it 20, early 2019. So even nine months prior to the onset of um, the, the, the initial first confirmed case in Wuhan in December, they said that they've detected it already um, in, in, in early in, in, in uh, was 2019, early, was it March 2019 already. Sorry, there was a second question. What was the second question? So no, it was just where uh, these, uh, these uh, water treatment uh, plants are situa situated. So, um, like, we, are they closer to hospitals, uh, communities? We are next to the hospital and the, we are actually, those 24 samples, he, um, the person, we've got somebody that collects the samples for us. So he's, he's got about four sites per day that he collects mm -hmm. at, and the sample comes in around about two o'clock. So we currently- but, um, Rabia, they want to know where we, where we got the samples from, the, where, where were the wastewater, the sewage, where did we get the samples from? from the, the areas. Yeah. So unfortunately, <laughs> I'm blinded to the study so that I'm not biased. So that's why I, can't, I just know it's all 24 wastewater. If I, you show, if I show you my map, so this mm -hmm. map, this is where it all comes from. Um, and the ones that we selecting, I can't tell you because I'm blinded to the study. I don't see where it's coming from. I just see numbers. So at the end of the eight weeks, I will be able to answer that question. And I think it's perfect like that. So I can't be biased in um, um, skewing. Because you know where the outbreaks are. So, so Rabia knows where the outbreaks are. So um, <laughs> she can't know where the samples come from. But we, but we are collecting them from wastewater um, areas, um, you know, from Stellenbosch to, um, to uh, Tigerberg to um, Athlone. 
so those were all the places where we where we where we're collecting the sewage from yeah so this was the original um these were the original ones that was included but the ones that we are currently doing so this is close enough to um uh, to, it's, it's in close proximity to 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 Tigerbook hospital so that is that is fine and we're next to them but the other samples the the ones that we are doing now those ones i I have no idea when, where they're collecting. I just see numbers. But what, like Linda was saying, that's correct. Can we get the water, the tap water? No. Okay. Uh, remember, remember what I said when I started the conversation? I said, please remember that we called it the inactivated virus because it, it's not transmissible. So no, please don't worry about it. It's just you shed the, vi the, 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 the um, viral RNA in the stool, but it's not transmissible, or there's no cases thus far showing that it's actually transmissible. And that's why we call it the inactivated virus. Thank you so much, a very important one. Prof, there are lots of questions around the excess deaths. So do you want to maybe address that? Thank you so much, Dr. Arabia. No problem, thank you very much. Yeah, I did. I, I, yeah, I mean, I did. I did put a lot of the questions in the um, in the chat box. But um, in terms of the, um, so I, I put some of the answers in the chat box. So the way we we we, man we monitor mortality is that we've been man monitoring um, death death rates for 20, 30 years in South Africa, and so we know from from historical data um, how death. Um, how much death happens um, each week in South Africa, and based on 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 um, on on past, um, we have a forecast what this year should look like, and then we mo we monitor um, forecast um, versus actual, and the the forecasted death versus the actual um, is 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 um, denoted as as excess death, and so that's ex so so basically it's forecast it's it's modelled. Are based on um, data, you know, we can share the methodology with you, but just to make it simple is that um, we, we have forecasted amounts and then we see what was different from the forecast. Was it less or more than last year? If it was more than last year, what was the reason? And if it's less than last year, what was the reason? So we monitor from year on year to try and see trends over time um, and um, how, you know, how death rates change um, year, to, year to year. Mm -hmm. Prof, another quick one. Do we have a sense of our, you know, the, the prevalence of asymptomatic um, infections in South Africa? So you did, uh, you know, speak about presymptomatic, uh, you know, prevalence, uh, but uh, do we have a sense of, I mean, we know uh, the international data around, uh, you know, the range, uh, but do we have a sense uh, on the local uh, asymptomatic prevalence? Yeah, so we, we think about 70% um, is, is asymptomatic, but we'll have better data because we're doing surveillance now. And so um, based on our surveillance, um, you know, one can see that um, uh, who was asymptomatic, because they, they might not even have known um, that they had the infection. So although we estimate around 70%, um, we can get more precision, um, you know, when we start to do the our, our seroprevalence studies, which we are doing at the moment, and picking up... Um, you know, people never knew that they were infected. And so if we look at, you know, if we look at um, between 50 and 70% has been indicated to be um, asymptomatic. Yeah, thanks Prof. There's been some questions and I think you've answered them around, you know, the use of fibrates, um, you know, in COVID. And I think you did say we're still waiting more data for that. And Prof, uh, there's another question around seasonality. I mean, we're seeing um, an increase in cases in the US and it's the peak of their summer and uh, it doesn't look like uh, there is any reduction in cases. Any thoughts? Yes, yeah, so we, as I mentioned before um, in my slides is that these, um, these coronaviruses, you know, persist for between two and four seasons. And so um, the ongoing, um, uh, um, uh, it's become endemic in, 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 in America, and this is because um, coronaviruses persist uh, for a couple of seasons, and um, that's why we need a, a, a COVID vaccine um, or, you know, or an antiviral, because unless we, you know, we either have to wait the seasons out, or we have to find some biomedical intervention to interrupt the transmission. Okay. Prof, I've got three last questions because I can see people are, are leaving. I think there was one comment around the fact that we're banning alcohol and, and smoking, but we see BMI as one 
uh, independent respecter for severe COVID disease? Should we not be banning other, uh, you know, like the fast food um, <laughs> outlets uh, to try and, and manage that? I think, uh, I don't know if you want to. I mean, to I comment. can answer, yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, maybe the relationship between body mass index and morbidity and mortality has not been well um, described. And uh, maybe we need more information. I mean, so maybe we need more communication about the importance of a, a healthy lifestyle. So we know that comorbidities increase um, mortality and hypertension, diabetes, obesity. And, and so, so, so what this is telling us is, is that um, you know, a healthy lifestyle um, is important. And if you do have these comorbidities, um, you, know, you must make sure that um, you, you're aware of them, you, you isolate and you also um, reduce your, um, you know, if you, if you are overweight, start exercising if, if you know, and it's, it's important not just for COVID, but for your general health. And then on, uh, the second last question is around uh, our reporting in terms of deaths. Um, when we report deaths, are we reporting deaths due to COVID versus deaths with COVID? <laughs> so, yes, I mean, that's going to be, we, you know, we, we have just introduced um, some guide, guidance on, on how to report um, COVID deaths, and we're going to be having a webinar on this. And, um, you know, so I think there's, there, you know, there's, you, if, you, if, you, if a person is suspected of having COVID, um, even though you don't have the lab results, if it, you know, smells like COVID and uh, um, uh, it looks like COVID, uh, you should call it COVID. If you're not sure, you could say um, you could give the primary cause of death, and you can say um, probable or possible COVID um, or secondary. You know, so there might be a primary reason. So we see a lot of comorbidities, particularly in children. Children may have sepsis and may have um, COVID as well. So they may not have died of COVID, um, but they might have uh, died with COVID, and that's an important thing. And so, so you know, you must always put your what you think your primary cause of death is. You know, obviously. Um, if someone died of COVID and, you, and they died of a heart attack and you know that they died of, of COVID, you shouldn't say heart attack. You should say uh, probable or possible COVID and secondary, the uh, um, you know, a myocardial infarction or whatever. So it's very important. Um, you know, there will be underreporting because people are still learning how to, how to work with their certificates. We will do webinars. We have got guidance that we put on our website at the MRC. And um, and you know it's just it's con we have to just continue to to practice um, writing the uh, the death certificates so we don't underreport um, deaths from COVID or overreport them as well. Thanks, Prof. And I think the last one was really around recoveries, and I think uh, it was uh, on the fact that we don't retest, but how do we then uh, report on recoveries? That's the last. Well, like, if the, if people are asymptomatic, um, you know, if people have recovered, they're asymptomatic, they're well. And and so um, as as we said that the at that stage um, the, there's no utility of having um, an, 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 a, another repeat test. So if if you've done your isolation, you, you're feeling well, um, and there there is no there, you know there is no t there is no reason to retest people. Thank you so much, Prof. I uh, really appreciate all the insights that you've shared. Uh, we might not have uh, covered all the questions, but we did our best to try and, and make sure that uh, all the questions were addressed. I think you answered some of them on the Q&A button. Thank you so much, Dr. Rabia. Very interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, we're looking forward to hearing more from you. And we'd like to thank all our participants uh, this evening for joining us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, have a good night. Thank you.